Notice the second thing that takes people captive and leads them away and spoils them is vain deceit. So they're preaching worldly philosophy and they are preaching vain deceit, which is emptiness. So it's a description of the kind of philosophy Paul is warning about, which is vain, empty, and deceptive. It's void of spiritual truth and power and real hope. I want to read verse 8, 9, and 10. Follow me with me in your Bible. Beware lest any man spoil you. That's primarily what Paul is trying to say tonight. Don't let anyone spoil your relationship to Jesus Christ. And he tells us how they spoil us through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. For in him, that is Christ, verse 9, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's one of the most profound statements about Jesus Christ in all the Bible. And then verse 10, and you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Paul the Apostle has been giving his heart to the believers at Colossae and in a sense praying for them and encouraging them to, after they've received Christ, to walk in the Lord. I want you to go back and see that verse 6. He says, if you have therefore received Christ, Jesus the Lord, walk in Him. Be rooted, verse 7, built up in Him. Be established in the faith as you've been taught and be abounding therein with thanksgiving. So Paul is concerned that the false teachers that had come into the church at Colossae, and they had come into the church at Colossae, would actually turn them away from their faith in Christ, from their fellowship with Christ, from walking in Christ, from growing in Christ. And as he said in another place of Scripture, their simplicity that is in Christ, and that they would be spoiled in their relationship. So Paul tonight gets into the heart of this second chapter, which is actually defending the preeminence of Christ against the false teachers who had invaded the church. Now, the danger to the Colossian believers were, was very real. They could look away from Christ to human speculation instead of divine revelation. And my heart is really stirred tonight because this same issue is with us. There are people out there who would want to spoil you in your faith in Christ and turn you away from following Christ, and we must be discerning and grounded, growing, and overflowing with gratitude toward Christ. So a grateful, grounded, growing, overflowing believer will not be deceived, but it's still with us today. And so there's a lot of stern warning here in this passage from Paul. He basically does two things, three verses, two things, and I want you to see this. In verse 8, he issues a warning. So verse 8 is a warning. He warns us, don't let anyone spoil you. Beware. And then verse 9, 10, and 9 and 10, he actually prescribes a safeguard. So he tells us, beware, verse 8, and then he tells us how to protect ourselves in verse 9. So not only gives us the negative to beware, but the positive of how to protect ourselves against these false teachers who would come and seek to lead us astray. Let's look first at the warning if you're taking notes in verse 8. Go back there with me. He says, Beware lest anyone spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So he starts with the word, look at it, verse 8, Beware. This is what's called a present active imperative. What it means is that it's a command. It's not an option. He's not giving us any suggestions here. He's actually commanding us that we should be on the lookout and be careful and beware. And because it's a present active imperative, it means that we are to continually, ongoingly, habitually be vigilant and beware. There's no letting down of your guard it means that we're constantly on the lookout. Now, Kenneth Wiest, who's a Greek scholar and done some excellent work on the Greek New Testament, 
He translates this, be constantly looking out, keep a watchful eye ever open. See, one of the problems that we have in our Christian culture today is that we're not vigilant, we're not sober, we're not looking, we're not thinking biblically, we're not rooted in God's Word, we're not careful. So we need to be careful we don't develop a critical attitude and we're we're judgmental of others but we should be discerning as to what is true and what is false. Basically, the idea here is that truth does matter. And the church has bought the lie that there is no truth. The truth doesn't matter. Truth is important. Or that your truth is your truth, my truth is my truth, and they have a relative kind of a view of truth that that doesn't really exist. It's all relative. But the believer who's grounded and growing in Christ and is believing in God's Word needs to understand that God's Word is truth and that there is a devil and he wants to deceive us and he wants to lead us away from our faith in Christ. So constantly be on the lookout is what that word beware means. Write down Philippians 3 and verse 2 where Paul again says, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. And again, even in this wonderful, joy-filled epistle of Philippians, Paul's worried about the Judaizers, which were putting legalism on the believers, and he warns them three times, beware of dogs. And interesting, he calls Jews dogs here because they were trying to Judaize Gentile believers. Beware of evil workers. They were fostering legalism upon them. And beware of the concision. It's a play on words. The word means the mutilators. And they were promoting a circumcision as being necessary for being a Christian. And so he calls them the mutilators. Remember, Jesus warned of wolves in sheep's clothing. Kind of the grandma, what big teeth you have thing, right? He says, beware of wolves who come in sheep's clothing. Outwardly, they look like sheep, but inwardly, they are ravening wolves. So we need to be discerning and we need to be grounded in God's Word. Now, he tells us why lest any man... Stop right there. Satan uses people to spread his lies. Anyone could be susceptible to being led astray if they veer from God's Word. So when you listen to a preacher, when you listen to them on the radio, when you listen to them online, when you listen to them on television, wherever you may listen to a preacher, or you read a book, oh, please, when you read a book, always judge it by the Word of God. The Word of God is the plumb line. The Word of God is the authority. The Word of God is the final court of appeals. So don't just say, well, I don't care what the Bible says. I believe it's true, or I want it to be true, or this is what I feel, this is what I want. Base what you believe on the Bible, the Word of God. Let me give you a principle for interpreting Scripture. You never interpret Scripture by your experience. You interpret your experience by Scripture. You never interpret the Scripture by your experience. I I know it's true. Well, How do you know? Because I felt it. I saw it. I experienced it. And I, I, I know experience is important, but the Bible is the final court of appeal. So you, you, you bring your experience to the Scriptures, and if the Scriptures aren't clear that that experience is valid and biblical and scriptural, then you reject your experience for the Word of God. That's so very important principle when you are interpreting Scripture. Too many people are going by their feelings or their emotions or the, what they were taught as children, or what you grew up with, or your tradition, or whatever it might be, you need to be grounded on the Scripture. So be careful, any man, any man. Paul said, if I or any even an angel preach another gospel, let them be anathema, which is cursed to the lowest hell, which is pretty radical. And I believe it's the pastor's job to faithfully teach the Bible so that the people are equipped to be discerning from truth from error and to warn them against the wolves who had come in sheep's 
clothing. But it's our job to be on alert. So don't be unloving when you do that. Remember Jesus said in Matthew 7, judge not lest you be judged. So that's a critical fault-finding attitude. So you don't want to be judgmental, but you want to be discerning. So you speak the truth in love. You take a stand on truth. But you're not being judgmental or critical. Now, why is it so important to stay alert and know the Bible? Lest any man spoil you. That spoil you literally means to carry you away as captive. That's literally what the phrase means in the Greek. It means to capture you and carry you away captive. The picture is taking away of slaves. Don't let anyone kidnap you. Some modern translations have. Believe it or not, uh, I was years ago kidnapped. And I, sometimes I forget about that and I can't believe it really happened. But I was with two other fellows, or one, one the pastor from my former church and another fellow drive does, drove, drove us to L.A. And instead of going into the airport and checking on our flight and eating before we left on our plane, I had the bright idea. It was my idea. So let's stop in town here and let's just get something to eat. So we went in the restaurant. We came out. There were people waiting. There was a couple guys in the parking lot hiding behind our car and with guns took us captive and put us in our car and began to rob us and then told us to start the car and drove off. And for about two hours or more, they held guns to our head and threatened to kill us and, and uh, held us captive in, in this vehicle. And uh, it's, a, it's a pretty helpless feeling to have someone take you captive against your will. I remember thinking, I wish they would just get out of the car, leave us alone, let us go. I wanted to get back and get on the plane and still take off for our flight. We were on our way to Australia to do a Bible conference over there. So, but I know the feeling of being captured or kidnapped and carried away. You know, the cults prey on weak believers, weak believers and also false professors. So when the cults knock on the door, and they may be from the Kingdom Hall, they're Jehovah's Witness, or they're Mormons, or some other cult group. If you don't know your Bible, you can be very easily taken captive. You invite them in, they begin to bring confusion and doubts and concerns, and you don't know what the truth is. And they use Christian language, but they give different definition to it. So the vocabulary is the same, but the dictionary is different. And they're masters of deception. So you need to be on alert and be careful that no one takes you captive. Now, how do false teachers captivate weak believers? What are their methods? Paul in our text, look at with me, lists five ways they take their captives prey. First of all, number one, verse eight, verse eight, through philosophy. Now, this is the only time this word appears in the Bible, this word philosophy, which literally means love of wisdom. And Paul was not against wisdom per se. He was against what we would call worldly wisdom, the wisdom of the world. Either you operate in the wisdom which comes from God, which comes down from above and is found in the Bible by revelation from God, or you operate in your own earthly wisdom, which is limited, or the wisdom of the world around you. The Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And there's nothing wrong with studying philosophy, but if it's worldly philosophy, you better be very well grounded in the Word of God and discerning and very careful that you are not taken captive by worldly philosophy. If you're a high school student or a college student especially, a lot of buzz about colleges today, right? Go to college and get all messed up. What do you get? Worldly philosophy. Not the wisdom from above. You know, the person that knows the Bible without a college education is way ahead of the person that has a college education without the Bible. I would rather have a knowledge of the Word of God than have a college education with knowledge that is contrary 
to the Word of God. So this philosophy that's mentioned in verse 8, which takes men captive, actually is worldly philosophy. Intellectualism, rationalism. Today, we see what's called progressive Christians. I don't really like that term. That's the term they would give themselves. They're known as liberal Christians. They deny the Bible is the inerrant, infallible, inspired Word of God. They deny the bodily resurrection, the deity, the virgin birth, all the essential Christian doctrines, but they say they're Christians and they deceive people and lead them astray by their worldly wisdom. When you read Paul's letter to the Corinthians, he talked about not preaching the wisdom of the world, but the wisdom of God. So be careful. True wisdom starts with the fear of the Lord and centers on Christ and is found in the Bible. Amen? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So learn to discern. Sadly, many in the church today are preaching the wisdom of the world and they're not preaching and teaching God's Word. Be careful. And then notice the second thing that takes people captive and leads them away and spoils them is vain deceit. So they're preaching worldly philosophy and they're preaching vain deceit, which is emptiness. So it's a description of the kind of philosophy Paul is warning about, which is vain, empty, and deceptive. It's void of spiritual truth and power and real hope. Jude chapter 1, or Jude 1, it's only one chapter in Jude, excuse me, verse 12 describes them as clouds without water. Now we've gotten quite a bit of rain last winter, this past winter, here in the Temecula Valley when we first moved down here from where we lived up in Highland, the San Bernardino area. There was just a couple winters there would hardly ever rain. My wife was like, it never rains here. It never rains here. It never rains here. Then finally, all it does is rain here. All it does is rain here. It rains here. Praise God. I mean, I kept saying, see, it rains here. It rains here. There is rain here. Don't worry. Don't freak out. But you know, when you need rain and clouds start coming, what do you do? You get all excited, right? Hey, I think it's going to rain. I think it's going to rain. And then the rain clouds come and then the rain clouds go and the rain clouds leave. And it's like, what happened to the rain? Come back. You know, you didn't rain. So when you need rain, you look for rain. So here's what the false teachers are like. Yeah, they're going to bring the truth. Where's the truth? There goes the truth. What happened to the truth? They just blow right by. But a picture Jude painted them. Clouds without waters. They don't bring any refreshment or meet any need. And then notice they're not only vain deceit, but they're void of spiritual truth and real hope. J.B. Phillips translates this high-sounding nonsense. I love that. Vain deceit. High-sounding nonsense. Sometimes you listen to him preach, and forgive me because I'm a preacher, I'm always analyzing preaching, but you listen to him preach, you go, wow, that's amazing. What's he saying? I don't know, but it's amazing. Real big words and fancy words and deep things of God, and they're getting a direct revelation from God, and they're sometimes talking to God while they're in the pulpit, and sometimes even arguing with God, and then they okay, God, I'll, I'll share that. And then they turn to the congregation and say, God said there's 10 people that want to give $1,000 right now. <laughs> and they, they just have all these crazy things, but, but they sound so intellectual and so impressive and so convincing, but there's nothing there. They're clouds without water because they're not preaching the Word of God, which is what we need. 2 Timothy chapter 4 says that they have itching ears and they turn away their ears from the truth and they're given unto fables. But Paul said, Timothy, you preach the Word. Preach the Word. Do it in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort, and do it with long suffering and patience. 
Because the time will come they will not endure sound doctrine. They want people to tickle their ears. And notice, not only do they have vain deceit, but thirdly, they have the traditions of men. Jesus warned of replacing God's Word with man's traditions. They negate the traditions of God, the teaching of God, for the traditions of men. Now, church tradition and tradition can be good if it is biblical, if it aligns with Scripture. One of the big errors that is made today is people put their faith in tradition rather than the Scriptures. The authority doesn't lie in tradition. There have been great periods of time in church history when the church has got things wrong and they needed a reformation or they needed a revival or they needed to get back to the book or back to the Word of God. So they, they circumvent, is the word I want to use, the teachings of God's Word for their own traditions. They know how to get around obedience to God's Word to keep their traditions. We need to know the difference between tradition and the Word of God. We need wisdom that comes from divine revelation found in God's Word. And then the fourth thing is the rudiments of the world. This is the one that's a little bit puzzling by the phraseology or the wording. The rudiments of the world and not after Christ. The word rudiments is used of anything which appeared in a row, a sequential row, a series. So it was used for the letters of the alphabet. We would say the A, B, C's. So Paul might be saying that to turn from divine revelation to human philosophy and human speculation is like going back to the ABCs or going back to the elementary issues. William MacDonald in his commentary said that these rudiments of the world are Jewish rituals, ceremonies, and ordinances by which men hope to obtain God's Favor. This is the element of the false teachers that was Jewish legalism. So they actually like to combine little of this, little of that, little of this, and create their own belief system. So they gave the Christians Jewish legalism. Some say it's an elementary spirits, and that if you look at verse 18 for just a second, we'll get there in a week or two. He says, let no man beguile you of your reward and voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. So the Gnostics were actually promoting this idea of worshiping angels because they believed that angels led to God or you had to go to God through angels. So you have the true God, emanations coming out of God, and you have to go through these emanations, these the spiritual beings, and in some cases angels, to get back to God. There, this has happened in, in, in the church's history in, up to today. People get all enamored by angels. And they forget about Jesus. And angels are great. And they're, they're, they're created by God for His bidding and to help God's people. But they're creatures. Anytime anyone fell down in front of an angel, what did the angel say? Don't worship me. Get up. Don't, 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 don't worship me. I, I mean... You know, if you saw an angel, you'd be tempted to do that, but don't, don't worship me. I'm just an angel. But they were worshiping angels or maybe praying to angels. False teachers were giving a combination of Greek philosophy, which is intellectualism, Jewish legalism, and spicing it up with a little Eastern mysticism. This is today what comes in the form of what's called Kabbalah, which means received tradition. I don't know where she's at today, and I don't follow her or really care too, but Madonna popularized Kabbalah a few years ago, which is Judaism mysticized. It's taking New Age occult and demonic teaching and imposing it into Judaism and thinking you're spiritual and that you're something special. And it's not after Christ. And that's number five. Look at it with me, verse eight. It's not after Christ. So it's philosophy, 
It's empty deceit, vain deceit, empty words. It's man-made tradition. It's the rudiments of the world, the rudiment spirits of the world, or the elementary spirits of the world. But the big problem, the end of verse 8, in the warning verse, not after what? Christ. It's all about Jesus Christ. So very important that when you are studying the Bible that you understand it's about Jesus. You know what the main theme of the Bible is? Jesus Christ. If you study the Bible and you don't come to Christ, you're not studying it properly. Jesus said, they testify of me. The Scriptures testify of me. They need to point us to Jesus. So very, very important. So not after Christ. And this is the big problem that Paul saw the danger of in the believers there in Colossae, that they were being led away from Christ. J.B. Phillips says, translates verse 8, be careful that nobody spoil your faith through intellectualism and high-sounding nonsense. Such stuff is a best found on men, uh, found, founded on men's ideas of the nature of the world and disregards Christ. That's a free paraphrase, not a translation, but it communicates what the text is about. Not after Christ. And notice it's not after Christ. It doesn't say not after his teaching, but after Christ. So there are those that think, well, we should just follow Christ's teaching, but Christianity is Christ. It's not his teaching. Now, it doesn't mean we disregard his teaching or we don't follow his teaching, but you, you don't become a Christian by doing what Jesus taught. You don't become a Christian by following Jesus' teaching. You become a Christian by knowing Christ, by having a relationship with Jesus Christ. A Christian is an individual that has a personal relationship with Christ. When you become a Christian, you actually know the Lord. Now, I know that freaks out non-Christians. They think you just have religion and you just kind of do the religious thing. But you say, no, I actually know God. I actually know Jesus. He's my Savior, my Lord, and my friend. And He walks with me and He talks with me. And we're friends, and we hang out, and I, 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 he's with me. He'll never leave me. And they just, they, they, they don't what, know what to do with that. They can't, com, doesn't compute. You, what do you mean you know Jesus? You, you know God. But that's the truth when you're a believer. It's knowing Him, loving Him, walking in Him, growing in Him. Again, go back to verse 7. You receive Christ, verse 6. Verse 7, you're rooted in Christ, you're built up in Christ, you're taught in Christ, you're abounding in thanksgiving for Christ. Verse 6 and 7, so that you will not be led astray. Now, the safeguards, verse 9 and 10, for in Him, so beware, verse 8, here's the rationale behind it, verse 9. For in Him... That is Christ. He just ends verse 9, or verse 8, excuse me, by mentioning Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you, as a believer, are complete in him, which is Christ, which is the head of all principality and power. All these angels all these ranking powerful, all these demonic spirit beings, Jesus Christ is over them. He is the head. He's, remember, the creator, the sustainer, and the goal of all creation. Now, Paul makes three profound affirmations about Christ. They're simple, but they're simply profound. Nothing new because it's true. Write this down. So the three profound affirmations of Christ. Christ has full deity. Notice that in verse 9. In Him, that is Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. I don't know how anyone can read that verse and study the Bible and not believe that Jesus Christ is not God. All the fullness of the Godhead dwells in Christ 
bodily. He is the eternal God. Let me give you some verses. John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the what? The Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. In the Greek, it's even stronger. And God was the Word. So He's the eternal Word in the beginning. He's the personal Word face to face with God the Father, with God. And He's the divine Word. The Word was God. John 1 1. So clear. So Jesus Christ is God and the fullness of the Godhead dwells in Him bodily. But then notice, secondly, Christ has real humanity. I know you hear me say this a lot, and you think there's nothing new, but my topics are dictated by the Scriptures, okay? So don't get upset with me. John, can't you preach anything new? I'm just going to preach the Bible. If you're bored with the Bible, you don't like the Bible, sorry about that. Real full deity and real genuine humanity. Truly are really man and really God at the same time. Look at verse 9. The fullness of the God that dwells how? Bodily. Underline that word bodily. Jesus was God in his pre-incarnate glory before the incarnation. Jesus was God in his incarnate humility. Jesus is God in his glorified majesty. So Jesus Christ has always been God and always will be God. There was never a time when Jesus did not exist. He's eternal, preexistent. Then he was incarnate to the womb of the Virgin Mary, and he was God and man in one person. Incarnate glory, incarnate humility, and pre-incarnate glory, incarnate humility, and glorified majesty. So Jesus is true deity and true humanity. Now here's the verse. John 1, verse 14. Remember I just gave you John 1, 1? Here's John 1, verse 14. And the Word, which is mentioned in verse 1, became what? Flesh. That's His humanity. And dwelt among us. That word dwelt among us, that phrase means pitched His tent among us. And we saw or beheld His glory, glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So that's His true humanity. And here's number 3, verse 10. Christ's complete sufficiency. So, full deity in Christ, full and real humanity in Christ, and complete or or total sufficiency. Now, notice verse 10. And you are complete in Him. That is one of the great themes of the book of Colossians. Our completeness in Christ. And I'll come back in just a second to that, but that word complete is actually a nautical term. It means you're ship-shaped, fully rigged, ready to sail. Now, I'm not a sailor. I think sailing's really cool. And the few times I've been able to sail on a sailboat, it's awesome. But uh, you got to know what you're doing out there. But to feel the wind, feel the sail, carry that boat or vessel over the water, is a real rush. But the idea that we're fully rigged, we're ready to sail, we're complete in Christ. This is one of the most profound statements in the Bible for believers. So very important. Because we as believers are in Christ, thus we are complete in Him. Every spiritual need and blessing is ours because of our position in Christ. This is the believer's position in Christ. Paul's favorite term for the believer is that they are in Christ, in Christ Jesus, or in Christ Jesus the Lord. Every Christian is in Christ, and in Christ every Christian is complete. Ephesians chapter 1 tells us to summarize it, that we in Christ are chosen 
by God the Father. We in Christ are redeemed by God the Son. And we are in Christ sealed by God the Holy Spirit. Read Ephesians chapter 1 and you read about blessed with all the blessings in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. That's Paul's theme there of all the blessings that we have in Christ. Every Christian is in Christ. Now, when does a Christian get in Christ? And where did you come from before you were in Christ? Well, before you were in Christ, you were in Adam. Adam meaning the Adam and the Eve in the Garden of Eden. You know about that Adam, right? You were all in Adam. In Adam, positionally, you were judged and condemned and separate from God. So when you put your faith in Christ, you believed in Christ, you repented and trusted Christ, and you were born again, you were forgiven of your sin, you were saved, you were taken out of Adam and you were placed into Christ positionally. Now, I've had people argue with me and say, well, maybe, maybe you're a Christian, but you're not really in Christ. That doesn't work that way. You cannot be a Christian without being in Christ. And if you're in Christ, all these blessings are yours. You don't have to work for them. You don't have to deserve them. You don't have to earn them. You're just because of Christ. They're imputed to you. They're, they're, it's called imputation. His righteousness. His, his holiness. It's all imputed to you. That's why it's so marvelous to, to be a Christian, saved by grace. All of Christ is given to me, and I, I stand before God the Father complete. When God the Father looks at you, He sees the righteousness of His Son, Jesus Christ. So don't, don't, don't let the devil beat you up and tell you you're not good enough to go to heaven. Just say, bug off, Beelzebub. I'm in Christ. And in Christ, I'm complete. Amen? I'm ready to go to heaven. How marvelous that is. Now, if this truth can get a hold of your, your mind, if this truth grabs a hold of your heart, it's a biblical truth, it'll revolutionize your Christian life. Nine times out of ten, when people come to me upset about their Christian life and frustrated, they don't understand this truth. Now, I don't want to... There's a thousand different directions I'd like to go but I think if you read Romans chapter 8, it's pretty convincing to me that once you've been placed into Christ, that you always will be in Christ. doesn't mean that you're always walking the way you should practically, experientially, but you should be, and you should be growing and showing evidence of being in Christ. But you've been placed in Christ, and that's why the Bible says in Ephesians that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. That's why in Romans chapter 8, Paul says that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. That's why Paul says there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Is that a license to sin? Absolutely not. Jesus told the woman in John 8, go and sin no more. But you don't have to perform to be in Christ you just have to be born into the Spirit by the Spirit into Christ. And here's the verse to write down, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. That's one of the most neglected verses in the church today. And misunderstood, but it actually teaches, I believe, that all Christians, the moment they are born again, the moment they are regenerated, that they are baptized by the Spirit into Christ, which is what's called the baptism of the Spirit whereby you are identified with Christ. You know, baptism isn't just about getting wet. It's not just about being dunked in water. It's not about just being immersed. It's about, ident it's about identification with. The word baptizo has that idea of identified with. When you take a piece of cloth and you baptizo it, you put it in purple dye, it turns purple. It becomes identified with that purple dye. But when the children of Israel went through the Red Sea and they were separated from Egypt unto Moses, it says they were baptized unto Moses in Corinthians. So they were identified with Moses. 
So I, I happen to believe that every Christian, the moment they are born again, is baptized by the Spirit into Christ. And that's how we get out of Adam and get into Christ. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. You didn't get yourself into Christ. You can't take yourself out of Christ. You're placed there by the work of God, by His Holy Spirit. What a marvelous truth that is. How marvelous, how wonderful. So, now that we're in Christ, born into His family, that we need to grow, not by addition, but by nutrition and appropriation. That's a very important distinction. When you're born into God's family, placed in Christ, taken out of Adam, you grow not by addition, which is what the false teachers were telling the Colossians. You need Greek philosophy. You need some worldly Sophia, some worldly wisdom. You need this experience. You need some Jewish legalism. No, I've got Christ. I have everything I need. I need addition. I need to grow. You know, when a baby is born, everything that baby needs to grow is in its DNA. All it needs is nourishment, right? We've, our first three children were girls. We had three girls. And all three of them were born with hardly any hair. The first daughter, first girl, our oldest Sarah, was born. She was as bald as you could be. I mean, she's like two years old, and we had to pin a, we had to, we had to Scott's tape a bow on her bald head. <laughs> Wearing a dress so that people know that's a girl. How old's your little boy? He's not a boy. He's bald, but he's not a boy. She's bald. It's a, it's a girl. So we, we taped a bow on her head. But in time, the hair came. Nourishment, growth. You know your baby born, born without teeth? You freak out. Ah, it's got no teeth. No, everything's there. The teeth will come. So a baby believer, everything's there. You just need to grow. You need to desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby, right? So it's not addition. I just the implications are staggering. Be careful. Don't tell don't let anyone tell you you gotta have this, you gotta have that, you gotta have this, you gotta have that. And you have Christ. Feed on him. Grow in him. Get grounded in him. Overflow with him. Focus on him. Feed on the word of God. Let God grow you in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. So very important. Charles Spurgeon taking this concept of complete in Christ. He said, number one, we are complete without Jewish ceremony. He said, number two, we are complete without empty philosophy. And he said, number three, we are complete without man-made tradition. I love that. We're complete in Christ without Jewish ceremony, empty philosophy, or man-made tradition. Jesus Christ is sufficient. Amen? Charles Wesley said, thou, O Christ, are all I need, more than all in thee I Fine, how marvelous. So in closing, verse 10, he is the head of all principality and power. If you have Jesus Christ, you have everything you need. Keep your eyes focused on him, amen? Let's pray.